Rhapsody was a series of video games developed by Nipponichi Software in their very early years. Before Disgaea was a thing, before the endless stream of C-tier RPGs, Rhapsody was their first JRPG to make it over in the West. In fact, it was only their second game to release in North America. It was a short-lived series with only three mainline games pumped out over three years. I mean, both sequels never made it out of Japan at the time. There were a couple of spin-offs, but perhaps the candle was a bit too bright. Rhapsody faded like the final note of a song. That was until Nipponichi Software decided there was money to be made, and over the past couple of years, all three mainline Rhapsody games have been remastered for Nintendo Switch. The first game, Rhapsody A Musical Adventure, which appears in the Prinny Presents Volume 3, and the two sequels, which now finally have an official English translation, Rhapsody 2 Ballad of the Little Princess, and Rhapsody 3 Memories of Maul Kingdom. These were in a double pack titled Maul Kingdom Chronicles. Rhapsody quickly garnered a reputation for being a kiddie, girly RPG, something that your niece would play while wearing her favourite Disney princess outfit. With outbursts of song and dance and handsome princes saving the day, and that is partly true, but I want to show you that there is depth to the series that anyone can enjoy, that it shouldn't be disregarded because of the cutesy exterior. It's 2024, us manly men can take one on the chin once in a while, but just to offset the girliness, balance things out a bit. I'm gonna need a little something to help me out. <clears throat> Can't get more manly than this. Oh yes. This video was voted for by my Patreon producers. Thank you for that. I wasn't expecting to do this series so soon, but here we are. And thank you to my Patreon supporters in general. It means the world to me, and not only do they get this little credit thing, but they also get lots of other perks too. They get to watch these videos early, they get behind the scenes content, access to a secret discord and even bonus videos. And the bonus video for this episode is a look at one of the spin-offs that was only released in Japan, Marl Digixo. You can understand why that may have stayed in Japan, but you can watch it on Patreon right now with the links below. Thank you ever so much. Just for the record, I'm only covering the first game in the series for this video. I was initially a bit undecided, I was planning on doing all of them, then just this one, then all of them, but at the end I decided just this one, and then maybe I will cover Rhapsody 2 and 3 for another video. Rhapsody was released in Japan in 1998 on the Sony PlayStation, titled literally as Puppet Princess of Marl Kingdom. I think that's interesting because there's no real feeling of the musical theme that awaits the player. Atlas, the North American publisher at the time, changed it to Rhapsody, a musical adventure. Which I like the name Rhapsody, it's JRPG enough to be intriguing. But a, a musical adventure? Come on, did we really need the double musical reference? That would have been enough to put me off as a kid. Musical adventure? Is this like Beauty and the Beast or something? There's an angel on the cover, yuck. And I have to say straight off the bat, it is a nice game, but it's far from essential. It's got a lot of good things going for it, but it also has a lot of flaws too. I do think it is worth talking about, however, even for a video as long as this one. And hopefully I can explain to you the good and the bad, and maybe even make you laugh at the same time. In this video, it's going to be full of spoilers. I'm going to take you through the entire story beat by beat, and bring up any points of interest and analysis and jokes when they arrive. So, where does Rhapsody begin? Well, where do all fairy tales usually begin? Our main girl is running in the darkness from some kind of predator, probably a Hollywood executive, but she is saved by Prince Charming, slaying the menace and instantly making the girl fall in love with him. It's the good old cliche, but of course, it is all a dream, and we see our bed-headed girl getting pelted up by some kind of fairy to wake up. This is Cornette, our main protagonist, and the ratty fairy girl is Kururu, which sounds like you're gargling some mouthwash. It's Cornette's goal in life to meet a charming prince. Yeah, total fantasy land. Charming, most of them are absolute pricks. Unless she's defining bank balance as charming, then fair enough. It seems that Cornette lives with her grandfather, and she has a mysterious gift to be able to talk with puppets. Puppets are dolls that are very popular in the Mal Kingdom, at least at this point. They're so common, it seems like they are the Furby fad of this era. They'll be out on the trash heap soon, don't worry. But that would be a shame, because they can talk, and Cornette also has the gift to make them join her side. Lend their power to her by playing her Cornette. Your name is Cornette, and you play a Cornette. 
I guess it's that naming thing when you go into the profession that you're named after. So like a weather presenter called Harold Snow, a chef called Helen Kitchen, a politician called Jeremy Liar, you know, that kind of thing. That's why I'm a Middle Eastern country. And you think I'm joking, but no, nominative determinism is a true thing. It really exists and I've got proof. Just look at how many porn stars are called Janice Juggs or whatever. That can't be a coincidence. We are introduced to our first normal puppet in Shart. Shart. Like, really? I, I know this is like the turn of the millennium, but I'm pretty sure portmanteaus were a known quantity at this time. Your first ally is Shart. I can't even get over that. Little Miss Shart tells you that she will join you if you help her find her sister. So apparently puppets have parents and can reproduce, unless it's some sort of spiritual sister, of course. So your grandpa asks you to go get some red enotium to make a fire stronger. The perfect pointless introductory JRPG task. Our home village is called Orange. I guess because it can grow oranges. There are bucket loads of oranges everywhere. They must be sick of them. It is a small town, but that's par for the course in this game. There are quite a few locations, but all are quite miniature. It's hardly Midgar. They are filled with NPCs, which surprisingly is one of the game's strong points. In fact, it's a bit of a necessity to talk with them for the plot of the game, but more on that later. Each town has a little busking center where musicians can perform for some cash. Not that you'll be begging for cash in this game, but you get a nice rendition of the game's main theme. And I got 15 Enotium. You can't even use the public bathroom for 15 Etonium. Gonna be taking a dump in the bush again. We have a small world map that gradually fills up with towns and other locations as we progress, but for now we can only go to Wonder Woods, and this will be a familiar sight throughout the game. Our two heroes seem to be having a lovely day in the woods. It's a beautiful place, the weather's nice. They are daydreaming about handsome princes, but there is something to spoil the moment. Our first battle against some frogs, Rah! Shock horror, the battle system may look a bit surprising. Strategy RPG fans' as eyes are lighting up, traditional turn-based fans are feeling a bit worried, well let me stop things getting out of hand. Tactical RPG fans zip your pants back up, traditional RPG fans put the Xanax down, okay, because this battle system is very deceptive. It looks like a tactical grid layout, but it has all the depth and strategy of a drunken teenager going in for his very first chat up at the bar. There's no thought needed really. The arenas are so small that for the most part, you can be within reach of every enemy in one turn. Placement makes almost no difference. The battles are also very short and kind of sweet. I mean, seriously, you will be one hit KOing almost every enemy in the game up until the last dungeon and the enemy misses you almost all of the time. So the battle is over before I can even get a proper explanation in. I'm sure I'll finish it soon. So it's time to have lunch, a picnic in the woods. Yeah, you know, smacking frogs is hungry work. After that, we get to see what this game truly has in its heart. You can almost hear in the background, Disney mode activate. I remember the song, I've known it for so long. And it feels so good to hear Sounds a little sad but sweet just the same Lovely melody Whenever I hear this song I really don't know why It makes me shed a little tear Tears will soon disappear because I know you're here. It's not called a musical adventure for nothing, and this is what gives the air of being a very girly game. Which teenage boy wants to listen to songs about feeling lonely and stuff apart from, you know, Green Day fans like me? Huh. It's not the same, okay? It's definitely not the same because there's no electric guitars and swear words. That makes a difference. Oh god, Green Day is just Disney musicals with spiky hair. In all seriousness, it is rather beautiful. I'm talking about Green Day's latest album. It's so good. But this is also pretty good too. The vocals aren't actually the best, which makes it even more realistic and relatable in a way, like she's a normal girl singing about her dead parents, as you do to entertain your little fairy friend. Oh yeah, there is a really tender moment where we essentially get told that her parents are dead and she hopes they are watching over her. 
This probably hits harder as a parent myself, but we can't get too sentimental because we've just got ambushed by a bunch of cats and a sort of cat witch girl who wants the Enotium for her boss called Marjorie apparently. It's all a bit comical, of course, and Kururu comes in for the win by calling them a bunch of morons. Nice. So, we have our second fight. Hopefully I can get more explanation in this time. It's turn-based on speed. You'll notice that Kururu isn't actually in the battles. She like floats around the arena. There's you and we have Shart. You can't have forgetting Shart already. Nobody can forget a Shart. Each character tends to have a normal attack and a magic attack, which they learn more of as they level up. For now, Shart can heal the party as well as perform holy magic. She is way too OP by the way. She's strong and supportive. She's an all-rounder. All-round badass. Cornette doesn't have magic, but she does have the horn, which if your puppets are in range, will power up their attacks, as though they weren't strong enough. Something which the manual explains, but I don't like reading, so I had no idea up till the very end of the game, but if you do this, you get a note added to the bar line at the top. That grants you points if you do it over time, and you can cash them out for a special attack from Cornette. They are totally random, like pancakes falling down on the enemy, sugar bit meteors, uh, I don't know, it's weird. Where did this come from? I didn't use this often because, well, there's not much of a need. Most battles are over super quickly. And that's that for the most part. It's really basic. After easily beating the cats, Meow, that's the cat girl's name, decides enough is enough and summons a dragon, as you do. Obviously, this may be a bit too much for our level 3 party. Kururu wants to give up the Enotium, but Cornette is just too stubborn and doesn't know when to pick her battles. But not to worry because there is a handsome prince here to save the day. This is Prince Ferdinand, and Cornette is so awestruck that she can't even utter a single word to him as he takes his leave back to the castle. She spends her days sighing out of windows, it's actually quite funny. So now, the entire plot of the game is focused on seducing the prince. Like Kururu basically forces her to go on a mission to find out more information about him so they can fall in love with each other. A ridiculously childish concept that would come from teenage girls. You can almost imagine it. I don't know, I've never been in a teenage girl's bedroom before, nor have I been to any of their sleepovers, but I can imagine they're always conspiring how to make love potions for the star of the football team. Or is that just the boys? So that's what we're doing. We are going to stalk a prince. It's okay when girls do it, apparently. So now we are told we should ask about him in our village and the capital city of Mother Green, which is the gay Paris of this world. High class gentry and you're looking like a bit of a country bumpkin. People even tell you to dress nicer if you want to be in the presence of the prince. Here, have a walk around, talk with everyone. It will come in super handy later if you know what's in every building because in this game, you don't really get told where to go. You just get told what you need to be looking out for. Like here, for example, if you go in here and talk with this lady, she says her husband is the captain of a ship. He's not here right now and it seems like useless information, but later in the game, you are told, hey, we need to find a ship to take us somewhere. You're not told where to find a ship, but if you visited this house before, then you might have a good idea. I think that's pretty clever. But anyways, there is this house with an egg soldier thing. This is a puppet. You can talk with puppets. The lady doesn't want it and she gives it to you. And this puppet, he promises to join your party in your adventure if you help him find his two other egg brothers. And so you play your horn and we have a new party member, Humpty Dumpty or Kid as he's known. So we have Shart who's looking for her sister and we have Kid who's looking for his brothers. And this is kind of a theme of the game because while they aren't necessary to do, these optional team members also constitute as the game's side quest for the most part. All the big ones have side quests that increase the length of the game by a little bit and there's no help, no direction. You just have to hope you bump into the quest along the way. I didn't do most of them to be honest, but I think it's a nice goal to have. Anyways, we hear in the local restaurant that the prince has a penchant for the local fish, specifically the bobo. So we're heading back into the woods to catch some fish. Before that though, we bump into someone who's antagonistic towards the main character, but internally likes them or is actually friendly when it comes down to it. I'm sure there is an official term for that trope, but I'm going to roll with friend who's an absolute twat. Something like that. This is Etoile. She's the richest and most popular bachelorette in the kingdom. She won Miss Mall competition more than anyone. At this point, it is unclear about the relationship between Etoile and Cornette and how they could possibly have crossed paths previously considering they are so far removed in terms of status. As Kururu puts it, 
She is a self-centered, egotistical maniac. I like Kururu. It seems irrelevant to the current situation, but she does mention getting a dress fitted for an upcoming competition. Maybe we'll see more of that later. Anyways, to the river I go. Gotta catch some fish. Instead of using a fishing rod, we're gonna wait for them to jump out of the river and we will beat them to a pulp. That was the idea anyways, but actually, they beat me to a pulp. I lost. Game over. One of, if not the, easiest JRPG in gaming history, and I got a game over right at the beginning. In my defense, and I know being a smeghead isn't admissible in court, but aside from that, throughout my playtime right now, this like one hour, 40 minutes, whatever it was, I did not have one single random battle. So I wasn't as leveled as the game expected me to be. I mean, one extra level would have been fine, but no, game over. And this isn't a modern game where you can instantly retry, no, you load your last save file, which for me was right at the beginning of the game. Four minutes in, good job on losing 40 minutes of your life, Jordan. Not that you do anything useful with it anyways, but... Mm. So, I had to play through the whole thing again, but this time, making sure I actually had a random battle or two so I wouldn't face the same embarrassment. And also, I should show off another feature of this game, something I really do like. Not only do you find puppets to help you, but monsters too. Puppets and monsters work slightly differently and are acquired differently, but if in a battle, Cornette gets the finishing blow on a monster with her trusty trumpet, there is a chance that at the end of the battle, that monster may ask to join you. I don't know what the chance is, and it seems completely random, but yeah, you'll occasionally get asked by a monster if they can join you. And there are a lot of monsters in this game, so there's potentially a Pokemon-like element to keep you going. Unfortunately, you can't get all of them because you only have a finite amount of room, both in your party and in your storage. You can't have all the monsters and all the puppets together, which is a shame. But there is still a goal to aim for and can really extend the playtime of the game if you want to capture as many as possible. Like in my restart, I managed to get a crappy little slime during my random battle before I went on to face the fish again. There was no way I was going to lose against the fish with a slime in my party. He's got a cactus, what a legend. So, I got my fish. I want to give it to the prince, right? That was the seeming goal of the current situation. So at this point, I wandered around the castle for like 15 minutes seeking the prince's presence, as though the thought of slamming down a wet raw fish on his plate would arouse him. Yeah, I didn't realize I should go home and cook the fish first. Thankfully, Kururu knows a secret passage into the castle which brings you into the male's toilet. Nothing quite like bringing a cooked meal through the sewage system and into a public bathroom. It just adds that extra tinge of cleaning cubeness to the fragrance, you know? It's the secret you learn after you get your first Michelin star. We are introduced to Golonzo, who's just taken a nasty dump, and there's an awkward scene that wouldn't be too out of place in Hollywood, or more likely at a gaming expo with famous YouTubers. Rejecting the perversions of a maniac minister, after a scramble, you're then accused of trying to assassinate him. The perfect gaslighting plot. Like, if someone comes accusing you of something, you just turn it around and say, Hey, you're trying to assassinate me. And then they go, what? And he won. And it should work here, except everyone hates this dick and wishes the assassin had done a proper job on him. Yeah, if you've spoken to a few NPCs, you'll get the hint that this dude is not a popular fella. He's a politician. Of course, it makes sense. And so our plan has kind of failed. I assume fish is off the menu. But how about that competition Etoile talked about before? Well, you're signing up for it. Not before she bursts into the room to put you down. At this point, you're probably thinking she might be the main villain. Defeating her in a pageantary competition. Sounds kind of awesome. She tells you not to enter, and I think we can all get a trickling of her real self underneath, maybe some doubt, and maybe fear within her. But she's gonna make your life hard by buying up all the dresses in town. Yeah, you need to wear a dress, and you've got nowhere to buy one. And that is the next goal of this game, buy a dress. So far, our goals have been seducing a prince, cooking for a prince, and now buying a dress. Don't you dare think this game is misogynistic. At this point, I am a little bit lost because nowhere in town sells one, no one in your village. I really had no idea where to go, but 
one dude gave me the keys to the plot and says to go to Wonder Woods again because there used to be a theater there. Maybe we can take a dusty old dress or something. So for the third time within an hour, we are heading back to Wonder Woods. And mark my words, this is a small place. It's only a few screens long and I certainly don't remember seeing any theater, but it is hidden away in an inaccessible place until the cutscene dictates it. So. It's now a restaurant and there's no one here aside from monsters. In the kitchen we some familiar kitties and this is a barbecue restaurant by the way and the meat, well it's you. You are your own meal or at least the meal for these kitties so we have to fight the chef and the cat and I think this is our first boss fight. Not that that really means anything in the context of Rhapsody because he goes down in three hits without much of a scratch. Okay my slime got an unexpected blow but nothing to worry about. It's here in the back room of this restaurant slash former theater, we find the only clothes available, a mascot costume. Kururu persuades you that it would be the best thing to show up in. Maybe she's the real villain. I mean, this is truly your best mate trying their utmost to embarrass you like only true best friends can do. And I suppose there is logic in the madness because if there's no nice dress to wear and you only have your farmer girl clothes, why not take a risk and do something a bit different? You might not be able to show your tits off, but you can show your personality off, which is what the rich people really care about, right? Anyways, this mascot isn't just a costume, but also a puppet, so you can use him in a fight too. You can use him to punch people when they laugh at you for looking ridiculous. So now we can enter the competition, hosted by the prince's mother. This year's pageant is more special as the winner will also be eligible to marry the prince. That's how a mother always dreams of sending off their son for marriage. Better than in a raffle, I suppose. But then she'd make absolute bookage with the amount of tickets she could sell. Not a bad way to make some money for any struggling parents out there. It's not just a dress up contest though, because there are three rounds. Firstly, who looks the prettiest? It's standard. You can't have a munter messing up the royal bloodline. Learning from the mistakes of European royalty. Don't get married to stop wars. Come on, marry to stay a pretty family. Secondly, combat. God knows the future king will gain massive bloated weight and need his wife to protect him. And thirdly, a singing contest. I'm feeling good. That's not the song. I'm just feeling good about the whole situation. I've already got it in the bag. If I wasn't about to walk out like I'm a Disney World reject. But forget that for a moment because there's a really important scene with Etoile. Let's face it, she's been the biggest bitch on the block so far, but now it's time to thaw the ice away where we can see what she's really all about. She's biting back at her father, claiming that she doesn't want to get married to the prince. In fact, she doesn't want to marry anyone because she saw what marriage was like between him and her mother. Damn girl. She accuses her father of only using her to move up the social ladder. Bam. We get told Etoile was much more down to earth when she was young. That was until Mr. Rosenqueen, her father, his business started growing exponentially and they neglected being with her, only giving her money rather than love. He still wants you to be friends with her and take care of her. And after he leaves, Kururu says he's a good father. Wait, what? The dude literally just admitted to neglecting her for a decade and feeding her with money to make her into a self-centered crazy maniac. And he just chinned her for speaking out some truths. What a dick he is. That's good fatherhood? Erin? Daddy wants a word. As you can imagine, the first round is a bit of a disaster. I mean, she stood out, but Cornette is properly pissed at Kururu for potentially ruining her chance with love of the prince. And she tells her, get out of my sight. To be fair, I would have done the same. Absolute joke of a friend. There's no time to dwell though, since we need to focus on round two. Well, we have a simple fight. It's really easy. Although at the end, Cornette doesn't think so. It seems like her horn isn't working as efficiently as normal. And we get a flashback to when she was small. The horn was her mother's and it has special powers to make wishes come true. But it can only work if there's other people wishing for the same thing, which means she always needs to be 100% nice to her friends and her allies. That's even better gaslighting because it's magical. Yeah, you're not allowed to disagree with them or you lose your power. I mean, this just shows that without Kururu by your side, you're not all that powerful. And Etoile knows this and you both have a push fight about who's the shittest person. The one who won't make up with her father or the one who won't make up with her best friend. Hey, whoever loses this fight needs to make up first. Deal. 
There's actually only one fight left because all the other girls bailed when they found out Etoile brought rocket launchers. Okay, that is really quite funny. You're destined to lose here because you don't have Kururu and Etoile has a shotgun. But not to worry, you're still through to the next round. So you've learned the error of your ways, your friends can never be wrong, what a life lesson to get, and now it's the singing competition. And Etoile is weirdly supportive of you, her mask has truly fallen for this part and it is really sweet. I remember the song, I've known it for so long, and it feels so good to hear. But even better is Etoile's song who is a bit on the nose, there's no analogies or metaphors, it's just I might look and act like a bitch but I'm a nice person underneath and it's really quite touching. You're such a lucky girl, that's what they always say, rich and beautiful. to see what's hidden deep inside so i feel all alone they keep telling me my life is so grand what will make them understand no one knows how truly lonely i am why won't I'm not sure how much I can show you due to YouTube's copyright, but I do like it a lot. It certainly makes Rhapsody massively unique and there's nothing quite like it aside from, well, Rhapsody 2 and 3. Apparently the Queen says you are both awesome and you are both the winners. Although the real winner is the Prince because that probably means a threesome. Thanks mom, best birthday present ever. Although I did get a Nintendo 64 and Super Mario 64 for my birthday, which I think we can all agree is a lot better. His real birthday party is next week and you've been invited to dance with the prince. The only caveat is that you have to wear the same dress as you did in the event. The dance doesn't quite go to plan but the prince finally recognises you as the girl he rescued two hours ago. But he's not the only person who remembers you because after a nice proper song and dance, Golonzo the minister also sees you were his would-be assassin. He even attacks you which then gets his arse fired. Yeah, maybe not have skeleton bandits and werewolves with you on royal property, so uh, I think we can all assume from now he's gonna want revenge. Prince and Cornette have a lovely moment together, and we can actually see not only is Cornette a bit of a dork, but the Prince is also a dork too. They're an adorkable couple. But the mood isn't going to last, because there are pirates here to ruin the moment. Meow, the cat girl we saw at the beginning, told her master, Marjorie, about the incident of the Prince and wants revenge. And not only do we see her with some of the finest pixel boob jiggle I've ever seen, but we also get to see her other lackeys, Gao, the muscle of the group, and also Crowdia, who thinks she's too good for all of these. It's safe to say they don't always get on, even though Marjorie is the boss. They don't have any respect for her. Unfortunately for the prince, despite Marjorie's seeming centuries on this earth, she falls in love with the prince at first sight. 
absolute cougar. And you wouldn't need to turn me to stone to hightail the hell out of this castle and into her base. Kingdom? Who needs one of them when you've got an immortal witch goddess to take care of? Which is the most interesting life? Well, that petrification was a mistake. She's a little bit rusty. You want to rescue him, but you get busted up pretty good by the inevitable sub-bosses later on. And that's where the first half of the game really ends, because you've seduced the prince already, you were about to land your first smackaroo on his lips, only to be thwarted at the last second. The second half of the game involves, but what, a journey to rescue the prince from the evil but quite nice witch Marjorie. But first, I want to give a shout out to Premium Edition Games. Why? Because I work for them. Premium Edition Games is a lovely producer of physical games on Nintendo Switch and PlayStation. We aim to do retro right. We have a bunch of indie classics, a ton of hidden gems made physically, put together with love. We don't just slap the games on a cartridge and send it on the conveyor belt like some other companies out there. We craft memorable, well put together packages where we treat each game with the same amount of attention that they deserve. Go check the links below, have a browse, and help support this small, passionate company run by actual collectors. We would love to grow and grow. Thanks for checking them out. Now back to that sexy witch. Grandpa, who I think is incredibly irresponsible and doesn't give a monkey's what you do, he's like, yeah, I know what you want to do. Good luck. Bye. At least he does give us the next destination, though. He tells you to go to the Wisdom Tower next to a village called Blue Cat. An old friend up there will help you with depetrifying the prince. He even tells us we need a ship to cross the waters. Hey, you remember that NPC with a captain for a husband? Well, we immediately get blocked, or at least slowed down, because he won't take you unless you fix his daughter's problem. She's angry at her boyfriend because he said she's fat, she needs some frogs as food to put on her a diet, it's all misunderstanding, and you just wasted 10 minutes of your life. Thanks, game padding. Not only do we have to go to the woods once again to get the frogs, but then we have to go back again to the restaurant to cook it. I mean, it's easy and fairly quick, but damn, did you really need to put the brakes on the story for this? You're even fighting the same easy boss again. Anyways, while you're on the journey, we bump over to the baddies who find their own way of curing the prince, and it's via a kiss from a maiden who's truly in love with him. Obviously, I think we all know Marjorie isn't a fair maiden anymore. I mean, I don't want to make assumptions about a girl, but we all know. We, we know. And we even see evidence. She gives him a good old lipstick mark and he is still solid, as we all would be. This is Blue Cat, a mining town of sorts called so thanks to the special cat's eyes jewels that they find in the local mine. If you enter the Wisdom Tower, you will see that you need a cat's eye jewel to enter the damn thing. So... It's obviously where we need to go. Although I do have to point out one of the most horrible bits of NPC talk I've ever encountered. In this house, there is a child crying because the mother was tired of the child talking to the dolls all day long. So she threw them into the river. And the dolls, they are sentient. It's just that most people can't talk with them. So she drowned a bunch of sentient puppets in the river. The child's best friends, Jesus Christ. Now I think this is technically our first dungeon, and let me tell you, what is one of the biggest flaws of Rhapsody? The dungeons, they are awful. Like usually games, RPGs, will have planners and map designers. This game 100% did not have a dungeon designer because there's nothing to them aside from random samey tiles put together in a completely arbitrary way with no rhyme or reason. There are no puzzles, just endless amounts of forks in the road that you're supposed to navigate. There's no map, and because everything looks the damn same, you will get lost, frustratingly so. You'll come to a dead end, you'll come to a treasure chest that has a pointless healing item in. They are incredibly boring, but thankfully are short enough. It's very, very rare I would advise this, but seriously, just either look up a map online or some kind of walkthrough because in these dungeons there is nothing interesting no discovery it might as well just be a long ass corridor of the same thing and i think there are only two types of dungeons in this game this cave type thing and a tower type thing which we'll see soon it's just so boring this one though is super short because you'll quickly find your way to the end to the boss which is terror and if you remember back about half an hour ago she looks suspiciously like Shot, who was looking for her sister. This is that sister. She ran away wanting to become human, then when she met them, she hated them, like we all do. 
and then the monsters tricked her into becoming evil or something like that. Anyways, she's easy, and then she joins you. At which point, Shart's side quest is complete. And when the side quest for a puppet is complete, like with El Kun, the mascot, when he finally danced on the big stage, their soul disappears. They've accomplished their mission in this existence, and they move into heaven of sorts. But they leave behind their body to keep helping you, which is actually quite bittersweet. You've helped them achieve their happiness and contentedness, but then you lose them in the end. But getting back on track, there's just an awful dungeon as you climb up the Tower of Wisdom to find the sage that your grandpa recommended. The only mildly interesting thing about this, and some of the dungeons, is that amongst the total random and non-thought-out layout of this thing, sometimes you may bump into a puppet that will fight you before joining you. There are a few of these night fellas hanging around, which have their own side quest if you want to face one of the tougher bosses later on, at least for me, but I'll talk about that later. After getting delirious from seeing the same shoddy stonework over and over again, you'll get to the top of Wisdom Tower and see good old Polanski, spelt with a Y and not an I, so no implications that he may be a disgraced director in hiding. I, you know what? I could see that. Maybe it is him. Maybe he's just an idiot. Ooh, I'll change one letter and they'll never know. He tells us that we need five heart stones in order to cure him. Waterstone, Firestone, Earthstone, Windstone, and Thunderstone. Almost enough stones to make a full evolution party. Anyways, we find out the connection between this old dude and Mustaki, who's been mentioned a few times up to this point, but it's only till later on I realize Mustaki is Cornette's grandfather, the master puppet maker. He and Mustaki were tasked with reviving an ancient weapon to fend off a military invasion from another kingdom years ago. They did it, but the weapon was too hot to handle, so they sealed it away. That was like 18 years ago. But before we know anything else, our young heroes nope the hell out of this long ass anecdote. So now we can go to a new place, or I should say places, because unless I manage to do things in the perfect order by chance, I believe this part of the game is kind of non-linear, or at least in some places, like getting the different stones. Anyways, the evil witch also now knows about the stones, thanks to cats dropping them eaveses. My slave, more beautiful than the goddess, I put her face to shame. Oh, look at me, what do you see? There's no one greater than me. I am the queen, the best you've seen, so worship me. Your Highness, Marjorie, we worship you as number one. Oh, yes, I am evil personified, so get down on your knees. And if you're ever graced by my beauty, you'll thank your lucky stars. Aren't I great? I'm amazing myself all the time. <laughs> there is one thing that I still have to get. I won't rest till he's mine, Prince Ferdinand. Don't you know you're old enough to be his mother? Hey, you shut up! My heart is burning, overheating with a raging fire. The prince I do admire, he fills me with desire. Dear Ferdinando, I am here to save you from this curse. Let his love quench my thirst. My precious, wait a little longer, I will end your strife. I'll bring you back to life, I'll be your wicked wife. Dear Ferdinando, I am here to save you from this curse. Let your love quench my thirst. Quench your thirst. If you dare to get in my way, we'll make you pay. You won't live another day. Queenie, just show your beauty. You're the baddest queen under the sun. Keep on shining, we'll keep on whining. She's our queen, she's the baddest to be seen. Marjali, you're the evil beauty. We bow down to you eternally. 
And for me, this is when the game bundles along at an astounding pace because I'm halfway through, like four hours in, yet I've got five stones to collect. That's not a lot of time to squeeze these in, and for sure it is fast. We enter the village of Red Hot, which is sort of a frontier town, I guess, with the new residents fighting for their lives to live there, thanks to dragons menacing the damn place. You are asked to protect the town, which you agree to. How can you say no to that? You enter into the volcano to fight the dragon couple there, not before bumping into Crowdia, who also wants to get her hands on it. You can tell this dungeon is totally different from the previous ones because now it's got a red tinge to it, much different. In reality, it's exactly the same, and I wish there was something to talk about, but there isn't. You'll be getting into random battles, a lot, mostly with the same party you always have because it's punishing to use something new because they all start at level 1 when you get them. Although I did start to try out Legend because it's something my daughter would literally squeal over if she ever saw it. It's so cute! Even though I think the game describes it as the destroyer of worlds or nightmares, something menacing like that. Anyways, you defeat one of the dragons and Crowdia is actually pissed. She might be working for an evil witch and in fact related to her, but damn you dare kill a magnificent creature. And she's probably right too, because an earthquake starts and the dragon was the only thing keeping the volcano at bay. Inside the volcano is an egg, and it's a bit of an anticlimax because, like, nothing happens. Like, what do I do? So, you go all the way back to the village, where you hear the dragon, and then what do you do? You have to go all the way back through the dungeon and back to the egg where you just were. What? What was the point of any of that? What a colossal waste of time. Well, not really time, just patience. I mean, I like this game, but this just completely baffled me as to its purpose. Now, it turns out the villagers defeated the other dragon and they give you the Firestone as thanks. There's still the egg though, and Cornette doesn't want to mercilessly destroy it, even though she was fine with the parents. And she makes her way out only to fight Crowdia, who wants the stone. But after you kick her ass, she saves you from the lava and leaves you with the egg saying, you're a terrible person and you deserve the responsibility of taking care of this egg thing. And I hope you think about this atrocity every second of your remaining life. I'm not sure what the moral of this section is. There are two places we can now go. There's up north to a cold place or down south to a warm desert oasis. I went there because it sounded cool. And this is where the windstone is. It's also where Etoile supposedly is, according to some NPCs, but she's locked herself in the dungeon so that no one can follow her. The only other key is with some bloke who's not in town. He went to send word to the queen. Okay, I know where the queen is, but uh, I couldn't find him. Like, anywhere. I looked in Mother Green, in the castle, even my home village, but nothing. So I called it off for the time being and headed north to White Snow. First thing you'll notice here is that when you talk to the first villager, you get some weird dialogue. This is White Snow, a town filled with snow. Enjoy the world of snow. And then in brackets at the end, this is what happens when you do a direct translation. Shots fired! Although I believe this is from the original translator from Atlas, like in 1999 or 2000, when no one cared or realized what was going on with some translations, but it is mildly amusing that this Nintendo Switch version from NIS America, who are public enemy number one right now, with them going their own way with translations sometimes, and they keep digging their holes deeper and deeper, or the angry purists will latch onto anything. I don't know. I don't have a horse in the race. But it's funny to see this pop up in an NIS America release. It's genuinely funny. So there is a boy called Albert here who is the apprentice to a master hunter, but his mother is deathly sick. And the only known way to cure her is with the Thunderstone in the Ice Temple. Unfortunately, he can't do it by himself, and his master doesn't want him to since taking the Thunderstone spells death for the Guardian Ninetales, which could doom the whole town. But to cut a short story even shorter, instead of stealing it, maybe we can ask their advice. Before we enter the tower, we get a rather random musical number. Mountain Man.
Well, that's made me feel more masculine. However, this ice temple is awful. It's so painfully bland. Would it have killed to add some puzzles, some unique rooms, a gimmick or two? Anything, just guard anything. Slippery floors, I would even accept slippery floors in an ice temple, even though in every other game, I hate slippery floors. I never thought I would ask for slippery floors in a game. But the nine tails are cute, I suppose. We then get a choice that I believe actually affects the story in a small way. You are asked if you want to fight the Ninetales, the Guardians. Well, I think we all know what happened with the dragon. I don't fancy babysitting five foxes after I just murdered their parents, so I'll pass on laying down the smackdown. And also, I might feel a bit bad for dooming the entire village. But hey, what do you know? They give it to you for free. After you fight Gao, of course, who's coming to steal it. She is really easy, though. That's two stones down, three to go. Next, I'm heading to Blue Cat, because as one should do in this game, Talking to NPCs, I was told that a bunch of pirates are out there looking for the water stone. It's like they were destined for it. Now, I'd already been told where the pirate ship was ages ago, and I even went there before I was actually allowed, only to be greeted by a dead end. So now it's time to go back and greet the actual pirate ship. And thankfully, this is by far and away the most interesting dungeon in the entire game. And let me tell you why. One, it's visually unique. It's not a cave or a tower. It's an actual ship. Although it might have been quite funny if they somehow excused having a tower style dungeon. And two, the story is integrated within the tower at least a little bit. Like the captain of the ship lost his son to some kind of disaster years ago. That son's best friend survived, but the captain never forgave him for seemingly leaving his son behind. We go through the real ship and then into the wreck ship, kind of, I think. And then we see that his son is still around in spirit but can't ascend to a higher plane until his dad stops laying the blame on his mate. He's been suffering in limbo for years because of his dad. Thanks, dad. Anyways, we get a funny scene with Gao, who swam all the way underwater to get here and is swimming all the way back too. She is a strong dog lady. Three stones down. After talking to some random girl in the pub, as you do, we hear that the Earth Stone may be located in the Frog Kingdom, so we are off to Kero Kero. Now this is nicely exotic. Not only are humans a thing, but there's also some frog people on this planet too. There is a bit of an issue though. Some girl dressed like a cat came here and released some dangerous fish into the pond, meaning no one can get to the castle. Well, lucky for me, I'm an expert at dealing with fish, aside from that one time when they knocked me out. When did I last save? Of course, it's so ridiculously easy that it's hard to have anything to talk about. The only thing that stands out for this fight is that you're fighting on a thin bridge, so everything is bottlenecked, which might be good in a slightly more difficult game. So you do that and you're greeted as heroes since all the frogs are cowards and the king and queen treat you as their honored guest. And there's a really humorous scene where you're having a feast, which is, of course, designed for frogs in mind. After which, you are treated to a fabulous song and dance. But we need the stone, goddammit. Mosquito munching and froggy hoedowns can wait. After wandering around and talking to some frogs, one of whom tells us that Golonzo is sexy, all right, we see a bit of a scene happening in the main hall. Princess Caroline's wannabe prince, her secret lover, was found trespassing on castle grounds and is sentenced to death. His name is Michael, which is a perfect name for a frog. If I ever have a frog, I will call him Michael. The girls, the queen and the princess, beg the king to be leaning on poor Michael, and he says mm, he'll consider it if he delves into almost certain death by collecting the earth stone. Although certain death in Rhapsody terms is essentially a paper cut. Certain death. You agree to accompany him, as you do. Another boring ass tower, but now we come to a boss who actually takes multiple hits to go down. Please have mercy on me, Rhapsody. He actually took quite a beating. And this is what the game should have been. I don't need it to be like Dark Souls, but the fact that this battle lasted two minutes, which is two minutes longer than any other battle, that would have been swell for the game. But regardless, we got the Earthstone, which surely means we got Michael off the hook, right? Well, he says yes, you can marry her, but you still need to pay for your crimes.
Wow, that was surprisingly shocking, and I genuinely gasped out loud when that happened. <laughs> Poor Michael. And while we have one more stone to go, I do want to mention a side quest that came out as a result of this event. If you randomly go into one of the mountains, you will find a grave. A grave that is marked Michael and Caroline. Princess Caroline ended her own life grieving for her love. Whoa, and now her kingdom has no heir to the throne. And even weirder, they are reincarnated as frogs and join your party. Although part of me is urging to sell one of them to the monster trader because Shakespeare, not even he could write that level of tragedy. All right, one more to go. I need to find the key to find Etoile. It turns out I didn't look in the most obvious place. Where does the game always want me to go? Back into the woods, back into the restaurant, and there he is. <laughs> Let's find Etoile. This is the weirdest place of all because it's almost like we land in a human world. I don't know what the full lore of this universe, the Marl Kingdom universe is, but I assume our modern day is well in the past and Marl Kingdom is a millennia in the future or something like that because there's a train. I mean, okay, the train has a heart, but who knows what Elon Musk is up to at his desk right now? Who needs petrol? Who needs electric? All you need is blood pumping through it. I'm getting ahead of myself though, since a lot of the disappeared subjects of the town were in fact somehow swallowed up by this train, now called Wiggle Town and they appear to be having a jolly good time of it. They love it here, and they don't want to go back. I mean, who cares about worried loved ones, wives with children to look after? This place is pretty chill, apart from the smell. But Etoile is not having any of it. She's frustrated by the lack of will from the others, and she can't do it by herself because the train has three hearts, and you need to defeat them in a very specific way. I can feel an actual puzzle brewing. But she's reluctant at first because she feels let down by the other residents and she needs encouraging. I can feel a song brewing. Why am I always feeling down? Why am I always so afraid? Why? Why have I given up hope? What is it you're afraid of? I know. It's okay, you can say I'm afraid to in the same way. I give up hope, I just can't cope, can't give my all much longer. You're not alone, so just hang on. You must try to be stronger. You can You can turn your life around That's the meaning of true courage So please remember Don't you ever give up trying Be courageous, keep on striving Fly to the stars You can have hope for tomorrow The left and right side of the heart need to be defeated at the exact same time before the main heart in the middle is vulnerable. How Etoile knows this doesn't matter. She'll take one side, we'll take the other. She says we should wait until the sixth turn to lay the final blow on the heart. Now, I can count. I promise you, I can count up to at least double figures, but paying attention long enough for the rounds to go around and then keep it, which one's... I just couldn't pay attention to that shit. I actually have to do it a second time. Thankfully, there is no game over. Etoile just shouts at you to try again. When you do succeed, however, then you and Etoile together take on the main heart and she comes packing heat. What a lady. After that, we get off the ride. We find some Enotium deposit, which gives us the windstone. We got what we need. We got all of them. But when we are about to deliver them to the old man, that good old trope pops up once again and we get ambushed by the cat girl. 
For some reason, also known as bad writing, she can't be defeated and you lose. You have to lose here. But instead of losing all your hard work up to this point, Kururu does something weird. She changes form into a buxom angelic goddess. I knew I liked her for some reason. Whatever power it was, she faints and you enter her dreams. Both you and Etoile who actually witnessed the event. We see a young cornet holding a small doll of Kururu in her hands, obviously lifeless right now, and an adult who one would assume is Cornette's mother, your mother. She gets to see her mother for the first time, at least now that she can remember stuff like this. And of course, it's all quite emotional, but Etoile is there to bring it up again by accidentally dissing her younger self. It turns out there are a bunch of earthquakes happening and young Cornet went underground, which is a very dangerous place, especially now that Galonzo is trying to reawaken the ancient weapon, the absolute prick. Suddenly Cornet's memory awakens. She remembers that it was this ancient machine that killed her mother, her mother that was trying to save her life. And even though she knows nothing can change the present, there's nothing quite like an opportunity to kick some ass. If anything, it's free therapy beating the crap out of your mother's murderer. And despite being an ultimate weapon of sorts, it ain't that strong. Even though you beat it, fate cannot be changed. Terminator 2 is turning in its grave. There is a heartbreaking scene as your mother says goodbye to your younger self, saying she's always watching over you. She asks to hear your horn one more time and asks the ancient gods to grant her one last wish. Without little Cornet noticing, some energy or maybe soul is then transferred into Kururu. Kururu is your mama. That is a pretty big twist. Until I saw the angel thing, I didn't see that coming to be honest, and it really enhances the story a lot. It lifts everything you've just experienced up to this point to another level, seeing it from almost a different perspective. But there's no time to dwell because we've got the stones, that means we can get to Beauty Castle. Oh yeah, by the way, the stones weren't to lift the curse after all. They were just being used as a key of sorts. The curse lifter is definitely the big wet kiss. But before we depart, Kururu needs to stay here to rest up. But she asks you a question that if you've been paying attention to the story so far, or at least when playing, it may not convey too well in this video. She asks, You'll be truly happy if you save the prince, right? That is a little bit gut-wrenching thinking about it, if you know what's going to happen. But press on, we must. And we're doing a bit of a side quest right now because Polanski gave us a key for the place where we can confront the ancient weapon. But we need three Mustaki knights in my party. Unfortunately, one of them I hadn't used at all, and the other two I used briefly out of novelty's sake. So they weren't exactly, shall we say, prepared to fight the hardest boss in the game. They died instantly, which left me with just Cornette going up against a mega boss. And I'm not saying it was easy, but it shouldn't have been this easy going solo. The one and only time I used healing items in this game was to beat this thing. Anyways, as we make our way up to Beauty Castle, we actually see that Golonzo has been working for the witch. Although it is clear that he is planning on betraying her with another ultimate weapon, like where is he getting these from? And this is the final dungeon. It looks different, it plays exactly the same, aside from one moment of madness from the developer by adding a small outside scene, calm down, don't exert yourself. This is the one place in the whole game where you won't take down enemies in one hit. 
and that's why it's the most immersive part of the game. Don't worry, there's no threat of a game over, but you do kind of want to make sure you don't take too many whacks. The final boss is coming soon. We make it to the throne room. I'm pretty confident. She talks smack, but can she dish it out? Uh, uh oh my, uh, oh, okay, okay. Things just got a tad more interesting. My robo dog just bit the dust, rest in chunks. Thankfully, I've got Shot there providing the big heals. I've still got my Eggman, now kicking ass. Sorry, I still didn't find your brothers. And aside from that first attack, which almost made me jump out of my seat and question when did I last save the game, she isn't that bad. Her lackeys go down in two big hits, and she doesn't last much longer either. After we defeat her, she's about to go again until she gets interrupted by someone. Who is that? I don't know, because I can't avert my eyes away from the pixel butt cheeks. And in fact, Marjorie goes after it. We get to watch a battle of those two scrapping. Again, it's difficult to focus on stuff, but she actually wins and is about to land the final blow before she blows herself up. Nice. So now it's time for you to step on the field. Somehow he's got backup for you and he doesn't have one form. He has two. Now he's golden. And just when you think you can't go on with this second form, Kururu and Etoile come to give backup. And just to add to the moment of excitement, my controller runs out of battery. At four minutes, outside that boss I had to do solo, this is the longest fight in the game. But again, it's just too easy. And this truly is the final boss. Game complete. Galonzo tries sneaking off, but is caught by the lackey trio to be punished. And there's only one thing left to do for us. And after all of this, Cornet says she's not sure if she can actually be with the prince. Come on, lady. Changing your mind at the last minute, you absolute tease. She says she's been through a lot, done many things that she'll regret, murdered thousands of monsters. She doesn't say that bit. But the prince says, I'm gone, love. You want to make me unhappy too? One final unhappiness. He's a persuasive fella. The money probably helps, but, you know, he's got his charm. We cut to them getting married and having a wedding reception. But something or someone is missing. And I'm just going to let this play out. I know some of you listen to these rather than watch and there's no voice acting so sorry for that but I think it's powerful enough that it needs to be shown in full. Someone chopping onions around here. God, and Bennett, that's like the saddest ending of a video game ever. Not only has she lost her mother, who she may have thought she finally got back, 
but she lost her best friend too. It's the double whammy of misery. I mean, it's fine, she's rich now, she can pay for the lifelong therapy, but damn, we kinda knew this was coming, but did it really have to hit us this hard? Losing Karuru would have been painful enough, but the mother too. Oh god, why did she have to find true happiness? Why couldn't she settle for mediocre happiness? Or even a solid, mildly contentedness? But no, she chose a homie over Momi or something like that. This is the saddest shit ever, man. This is genuinely sad. And it hits even harder as a parent myself. It's painful thinking about it. Rhapsody, despite two almost experience breaking flaws, was worth it for this payoff, for this heartbreak. But it's not all devastating news because after the credits, we get a nice little teaser. Cornette is pregnant and the baby is moving. They didn't waste any time at all. Cornette is convinced it's a girl and knows the perfect name for her, which is... Cliffhanger. Oh no, what's it gonna be? Let's play Rhapsody 2 to find out. Actually, I'm not gonna play Rhapsody 2, I'm gonna play Rhapsody 2 later. But yeah, let's consolidate my thoughts about Rhapsody 1. What do I think of it? Before that, if you've enjoyed this video so far, leave a like. It just helps out a lot, even in 2024 when you think it wouldn't. But it does, okay? Thank you. Now, I think I should get the bad things off my chest first, then we can end on the positive. So, what don't I like about Rhapsody? Well, it's too damn easy. So easy, in fact, that it negates the amount of effort put in by other programmers and designers. Because if you think about it, there is a fair amount of stuff going on here that's completely discarded by the fact that you don't need to consider it whatsoever. Like, did you know there are seven elements in this game with each enemy assigned one of them? I didn't. I mean, I saw these icons hanging around, but it's meaningless, completely meaningless. You don't need to think about them at all. The poor bloke who programmed water to be strong over fire, you just wasted a year of your life, my friend. I bet that brought on his midlife crisis half a decade early. Absolutely no need to pay attention to what he did. Well done. Status effects, completely pointless. You'll knock most of your enemies out in one hit. What's the point in paralyzing them? Why poison them? There's even one called philanthropy that I never even saw. It's just a wasted effort. Puppets and monsters. There are loads of puppets and even more monsters. And there's no need to go out of your way to recruit any of them. Because you can just stick with your first three and you're golden. They'll still wipe out the enemy in one hit. I only changed it up for the sake of footage. Wanting something different to show you guys. What's the point in having all these great looking creatures, puppets with interesting backstories if there's absolutely no point in using them outside of being OCD and collecting them all? I get it, you've got a finite amount of spending power as a kid, you had to squeeze the most out of every game and I commend Rhapsody for the side quest and monster collecting, but it would have been nice to make it, you know, useful. And of course, boredom, because it's so easy it can make it quite boring. Thankfully, I was interested in the story and I knew the game wasn't particularly long, but if that wasn't the case, I may have given up on the game through boredom in the gameplay. I did play on normal. I was strongly advised to start the game on hard, which isn't that much harder, but I think a critic should judge the game only on the difficulty that the developers intended. Normal. I mean, if you play on easy and you complain about the difficulty, nah. If you play on hard and complain about the difficulty, Nah, you just look like a moron. Nobody's going to take you seriously. However, if you play a normal or default, you can criticize it in either direction. Even though I had to play on normal in order to get a balanced and fair opinion, if you play Rhapsody, you should 100% play this game on hard. It doesn't make that much difference, but it may make the difference to you and your enjoyment. Usually when I see a press release saying the most accessible RPG ever made, what it turns out to be is a big bag of beige soup. But Rhapsody, it really does have a heart, and that's why I got over the fact it's painfully easy. It's got the soul, it's got the production value, it's got the attention to detail to become what I would say is the best universally accessible JRPG ever made. Well, maybe until I play 2, but I've been told 2 is a tiny bit more difficult, so I guess the crown has to go to this. And I'm a 33 year old dude, which makes me part of the demographic that thinks Everything should be aimed at them, and if it doesn't suit their needs, then it's rubbish. But no, as soon as my daughter can read like properly, and I want her to play a JRPG, want to get her into the genre, I am forcing her to play this, 
because as Rhapsody told me, it's fine for your dad to be extra overbearing. It means he truly loves you. It's the perfect game to introduce the genre to some. It's the perfect game for those who just want a proper chill story with some gameplay involvement. You know, it's a snowy weekend. You can beat this in a couple of days and have a nice time with it. Rhapsody took me nine and a half hours to beat, even taking into account the 40 minutes I lost from getting a game over and about 20 minutes gawping at the marginally illustrations in the bonus material. I did some of the side quests, but not all of them. And if you do the bare minimum and don't get distracted by Marjorie, you can get through this JRPG in about seven hours. That's kind of insane. And I've tried to think about this long and hard as to whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, at least five minutes were spent pondering this and I've come to the conclusion, yeah, it's erring on the bad side for me personally. I love a good story. That's why I play JRPGs. I do not play for the gameplay, although I have to admit Rhapsody did test that notion somewhat. I was worried my principles may mean jack after this, but Rhapsody has a lovely story, or at least a lovely framework of a story that could be fleshed out so much more. It's a whirlwind adventure I wanted to put the brakes on once in a while to smell the roses. You're blitzing through these tiny towns with these mini events that are over before they've actually started, like Red Hot with the dragons. You're there like 10 minutes and the majority of that time is pointlessly going in and out of the dungeon. A little bit more story would not have gone amiss. The best dungeon in the game, the pirate ship, is probably the shortest of the lot of them, which is a tragedy in and of itself. Can we just spend a bit more time in some of these places, please? It seems like wasted effort on the artists that we're just speeding through them. Of course, as I said, the length may be a bonus for some people out there. Not everyone wants to delve into a 40 or 50 hour RPG. I get it, we're all getting older. There are now more games than we know what to do with, and on the whole, despite everyone whining, we have more disposable income than we've ever had before. We have so much choice, many of us can't be spending time playing these giant games. I mean, we've got Netflix series to watch, we've got Futurama to re-watch for the 12th time, we've got memes to send to your friends in group chats. Important things must be done, and we have less time than ever. So, this could be a bit of a blessing for some people out there. Again, also for kids who have the patience of a hungry dog. I don't know what that means, but I'm rolling with it. Attention spans are low, and Rhapsody may be the perfect length for some. What I also dislike, and is the big reason number two, alongside the difficulty, it's the dungeons. Jesus Christ. Didn't anyone at Nipponichi, like during testing, even during the planning stage, say, Hang on, this is utterly boring. It wouldn't be so bad if the dungeons were one-off in visual design, but 80% of them are either caves or towers. And why was so little thought put into their layout? It's just square rooms with random doors and random stairs. I'm not saying they had to make it believable, like make it as though someone lived and worked there with a staff toilet or whatever, but just something to deviate, make it unique. And where are the puzzles? Puzzles are an essential part of a JRPG dungeon. They can either be overly complex brain twisters, or they can be just, you know, hitting a switch to unlock a door. Rhapsody can't even be asked to do that. Give me an hour. Just give me one hour, and I could come up with at least one interesting puzzle for each and every dungeon in this game. If you've played enough games, puzzles are easy to come up with on a conceptual level, but could they be asked to implement them? That's a whole other thing. But even then, you can design puzzles that need less effort to implement, you know, less art assets. I just think it's unnecessarily bland. No one needs to go this far bland. As far as I can remember, there are only two puzzles in this game. One of which is defeating the heart on the sixth turn, which the game outright tells you, and this puzzle to make the drawbridge go down, of which a person tells you the solution. Although I did do it backwards like an idiot, how am I supposed to know the top one is considered number one? They're not numbered. Of course, I haven't played Rhapsody 2 beyond the first hour or so, but I'm praying they improve the dungeon aspect because in many, many regards, it's far more offensive than the easy difficulty. I probably wouldn't have been so harsh on the difficulty had I been so distracted by great dungeon design. I think the blandness just enhanced how noticeable the easy difficulty is. They've just like augmented each other. As I said in the main part of this video, I would seldom recommend a guide or walkthrough for any video game unless you are well and truly out of ideas. I believe in people being able to do things for themselves, to work around logic or even work around illogic. There is an art to thinking illogically too. I believe in humans being smart, determined, self-reliant. 
I believe the reward for overcoming video game obtuseness is greater than the reward for just getting through it easily. However, Rhapsody is one game I would say with the dungeons, go to town on it. Whip up a map, follow a walkthrough just to get through it because I believe there's really nothing to be gained by doing it yourself. There's no logic to the dungeons, using your brain won't get you anywhere faster because it's look of the draw as to whether the door you entered is the right way or not. There's no personal reward, there's nothing interesting to wonder at, no locations for world building. Like if you're staring at a guide, you're just looking for the next exit they talk about. You're not really concerned about what's in front of you, the visual storytelling or whatnot. That's not really relevant for Rhapsody because there's nothing there for like discovery. It's just there to be there. As I already said, it might as well just be a long corridor. In fact, that would be less painful because at least then there wouldn't be any pointless dead ends to waste your time with. So yeah, those are my two big main bad points for Rhapsody, the dungeons and the difficulty. And I guess one point that's kind of in the middle depending on where you swing the length. But how about the good points? Well, thankfully, there are quite a lot. Firstly, pixel butt cheeks and boob bounce. That was an unexpected bonus. I am, of course, being a bit tongue in cheek. I wish, but it does lead me very nicely into one of the game's strongest points, the visuals. They are absolutely gorgeous, and no wonder the game is so short, they can't keep making visual masterpieces like this. Imagine the poor artist's hands. Back then they were probably paid minimum wage too. Each town is visually sublime, and you just wish there were a few bigger screens so you can get more of them in your eyeballs, like why are they so small? From the snowy winter wonderland, the piratey seaport and the big city, there's loads of visual variety too, except in the dungeons. I'm not sure if there is any PS1 game that is better looking in terms of detail than this. I mean, maybe Legend of Mana? And even then, I wouldn't say it was better, but you know, equal. And you have to remember how tiny Nippon Ichi were back then. They were a company known for making Mahjong games, whatever. This was a huge project for them. And going toe-to-toe -to -toe in quality against Square Enix, the biggest juggernaut in the JRPG world, it's very commendable, even if there is less of it here. The character designs are great too. It is Nipponichi style, but before they went full, you know, full Disgaea. You know what I mean. I like Disgaea for what it's worth, but this is just so much better in every way. Maybe it's not distinctive, but I think the characters are wonderful. They have a slightly grounded charm to them that's not over the top. Well, okay, aside from the furries, but you know, even they are grounded all things considered. It's actually looking at the designs though that made me realize just how few main and supporting characters there are in this game. You can count them on two hands pretty much. The monster design is pretty cool, but of course you can't have a JRPG without having palette swaps. Here's a different colored mushroom. Oh my God. Where the designs really shine for me is in the puppets. There aren't a lot of them, but I think Rhapsody has nicely unique allies in this regard. They are definitely distinct from monsters, even visually, like you can guess which is a puppet, which is a monster just by looking at them. Overall, it's a beautiful game. I just wish there was more of it. The story is good. Like I said, I wish it could be longer, given more time to breathe. But on the whole, it's pretty decent. The premise is very cliche, but that's kind of the whole point. It's a Disney fairy tale, rescuing the prince from an evil sexy witch. I mean, if Marjorie wants world domination, I say let her. Maybe that's just me. It's not really the greatest story that's good, it's the characters within it that's good. Their relationship and their connections with each other, the bonds they have and their interactions. It's a story of love, which is obvious to say when you're talking about Prince Charming, but really the love between Cornette and her friends. And of course her mother who's residing in Kururu. It somehow manages to mix happiness with tragedy in a really good way. It's not afraid to try and hit the feels with some simple but effective songs. I do question some of the messages and moralities here, but hey, not everything can be perfect. The fact that there are so few characters means we tend to get a good look at all the important ones enough in great detail, even with a short runtime. We kind of feel like we know everything about Cornet, Kururu, Etoile and so on. They have short scenes, but it is enough and they get the message across extremely well. And also, pull at your heartstrings. And that goddamn ending, Jesus Christ, it's like the saddest thing I've ever seen. I thought they're supposed to be happy. Even the world building is surprisingly good. I like the fact that you have to talk to people in order to progress in this game. If you don't talk with certain people, you won't be able to find the next location you need. You have to talk with everyone unless you happen to stumble upon the right person for the first time. So you get to pretty much know everything about the world and largely they have interesting things to say. And best of all, as the story progresses, those NPCs who are outside of houses, they change dialogue. 
they often have new things to say, referencing the progress of the story, like the supposed assassination attempt on Galonzo, and many other things. It's very impressive. And not only that, there are subplots that develop, like this kid who has a dog. There's a whole little storyline that you can see if you just pop back in here after every big story development. That's some really great attention to detail. Now the music is amazing perhaps relying on variations of one tune a little bit too much, but it's beautiful and sweet enough that it lives up to its musical name. The lyrics to the songs aren't exactly what you'd find in a number one hit or in a proper Disney animated feature, more like the scribbles in the diary of a poor sad teenager who goes to therapy, but the performance and instrumentation pull them up and they do make you feel rather emotional. I think it's all super beautiful and it's what makes Rhapsody a wholly unique experience. Sure, songs exist in other games, but I'm not sure to this extent, or at least when Rhapsody was new, it just makes me want more. And seeing these random songs and dance is joyful, and I want more JRPGs to have these. Not all of them, of course, that would get tiring, but suddenly breaking into song and dance is really a showpiece. Like, all your attention and your focus is on that moment. It really is a scene. I have to say one thing I wasn't keen on with the music. Cornette, she's supposed to be a good player, but damn it would be nice if she played more than one song. She only knows one song, and when people ask her to play, it's the only one she plays. I guess it imitates a bit of real life because when anyone asks me to play something on the guitar, it's 100% time of your life, much to everyone's regret. Rhapsody is the quintessential 6 out of 10 JRPG from back in the day, with the mindset of a late 90s game reviewer. But you know, times can change. I remember reading about how ridiculous and stupid it was for roguelikes like As Your Dreams, Time Stalkers, Shirin, to bring the player back down to level 1. People complained about that, and yet now that is literally every single indie game. Suddenly it's amazing. Tastes and trends change. Was Rhapsody ahead of its time? Maybe. The general gaming audience at that time were still, for the most part, edgy teenagers, young adults of the male variety, with a smattering of games available for parents who want to shut their child up for an afternoon. You can see this wouldn't have really sat well in the West. The gameplay is decidedly easy, and we all know difficulty was seen as a positive for game reviewers at that time. Even myself, I was about 10 when this released in the West, even though it didn't release in Europe, but if it did, and I walked into Electronic Boutique, I probably wouldn't have given this a second glance because gaming was cool and edgy at this point. Cute and whimsical didn't exist when you've got games like Wipeout, Final Fantasy VII, Resident Evil taking up space on shelves. The Dreamcast was out, don't forget that. Now we had super hyper realistic 3D graphics at home. What's with this hand-drawn baby nonsense? Nowadays, High quality artists are too expensive to hire to make this stuff anymore. Every indie game would love this quality of visuals for their sprites and backgrounds. There's just not the talent out there now. I think this game was done a little bit of an injustice, and I'm not saying it's like a 10 out of 10 game, far, far from it. It does have its serious flaws, but there's something so lovely and charming about Rhapsody that I think everyone needs to give it a try. And the Rhapsody games are connected story-wise. I've heard Rhapsody 2 is a much improved game, so if you want to try that, you can blast through this one in 8 hours. You can spare that for a JRPG, right? Thank you for watching. If you watched all the way through, please leave me a musical note emoji in the comments. Leave a like, that helps out. And if you want to be really awesome, you may want to check out my Patreon, where I give you lots of nice stuff. That really, really, really helps me. You know, these videos really don't earn much. Only Skies of Arcadia has actually been financially worth it. And you can also watch the bonus video for this video over there right now. It's about one of Rhapsody's spin-offs, Marl de Jigsaw. It should be up there right now. I do greatly appreciate you, and you can also support me by purchasing video games via the links in the description as well. That is an option. So I know what you're wondering, what is next? Well, it's going to be a while, but are you ready?
A special thanks to my super producers, Alexander Cato, Brent McLean, FF14 Best RPG, V, Sven Nowlitz, Wixit, Josh Foot, and Germonic.